Hey everybody and welcome back to the channel. Welcome back to some more Warforge and as we wind down on the last day of the rank season, I wanted to bring uh, a deck that I've said I'm going to be playing for a long time to the channel. Um, I, way back when I had even chosen the Eldar as the second uh, faction that I was going to go for and you know with progression it can take a while. I don't have premium for Eldar so it's just been a minute since I even thought to uh, you know play some Eldar and put them up on the channel but we're here today because as everyone has realized the Tau are you know quite powerful um, you know I don't think that they're broken I think again a lot of the higher end play against the, the best players is going to come down to particular matchups particular card choices um, deck builds all of that sort of stuff I do think all, on raw power level they are definitely, you know, above things like the Space Marines, potentially the Eldar as well. Um, you know, it, it does feel fair to compare them to the Orcs in the sense that they have a number of ways to kind of attack you from and that, you know, a lot of the cards are feeling a bit stronger just like by comparison. But I do think that what the Tau are weak in is really the fact that they need to set up. There, there's not really a single Tau build that doesn't need to have a certain sequence to kind of then go off, right? And so although Space Marines have been suffering and, you know, I'm hoping that the Ultramarines get a little bit of love in uh, the upcoming balance patch, I think a really great place to be, um, especially even just for climbing and having a deck that's going to be more of the aggressor in, a, in what I would say is a little bit of a slower uh, meta right now is Madrell Galen. And I, I really can't uh, recommend this deck enough. And I know it's coming out the last day of the season, but I just think that this is a deck that I, I would encourage people to, to kind of get back on the horse with uh, into Tau specifically. Now, I do think that the Orc and Chaos matchup, as always, are tough, right? You have to be playing perfectly. Every point of damage matters. You got to make sure that you're able to close it out. And against, uh, you know, Gaskell... In particular, it's really, really tough. And the amount of healing that they're able to put up and the armor is going to mean that there is going to come kind of a point in the game, and this is the same of against Abaddon too, where you're just not going to be able to close it out. So you, you just have to be keeping your, your foot on the gas and really sequencing. So this is a deck I wouldn't recommend to a beginner uh, because it's going to take time to pick it up. I don't think it's necessarily hard to pilot itself. Like it, it plays pretty clear, but when you play into certain matchups and into certain metas, you, you have to know what you're doing. And I think I have a bit of that experience, not even just from playing the game a ton. Of course I do. Um, but playing a ton of orcs, not so much chaos, but playing against it quite a lot and playing a ton of Tau. So, um, I think I also feel like I have a little bit of an edge because I'm just playing from the perspective of like, I know what that player should be doing. And I don't know that everyone is always clear on what, you know, the Eldar and specifically Madrail um, is capable of. So um, if you uh, continue to, you know, follow my content here, feel free to like and subscribe. Um, I think most, uh, about half of my viewers aren't always subscribed. So appreciate it if, if you're digging it. Um, but always feel free to share your support with likes and comments and interaction, all of that. Um, and I do have some very fun stuff coming up. If you didn't see my community post, um, we are definitely going to be introducing perks at some point. So I don't want to, I'm going to have my own announcement video on how that all is going to go. Um, but we've got some exciting stuff to do. So uh, as you can see, I'm already diving in. I'm recording from uh, my family's place. So it's a little bit of a different setup, but I hope, hope it works out. And, uh, and I've also noticed that a lot of my videos have been very talk heavy, but like specifically no gameplay. So today we're going to change that. And I think moving forward, uh, I feel like I'm picking up what the viewers are putting down that uh, we, we need to be having a little bit more gameplay on the channel and a, a little less of just the theory crafting. So um, we are going to look at two wins. Yes, of course, uh, to show uh, the, the two well, I think the number one toughest matchup, which is Orcs, um, and Chaos is, is in there too, but uh, we're going to look at an Orcs game that I played um, when I went on a, a pretty huge tear last night, and I've been trying to keep up in the leaderboard, leaderboard today, um, and then a Tau matchup as well, and both players are very close to or above my rating, so um, 
the orcs player i'm blanking on the name but we'll get into the game uh very shortly uh is i think was around 3400 and then barrack who is in uh on the leaderboard pretty high up i think was at 4200 um i played a lot of games these last two days of people in the 25 to 2700 range which i think it's all they're all good players but like in terms of the ladder it's felt tough to climb because i'll get the same number of points i get from them that i do from a bot so it's been kind of tough and i i wanted to feature um you know two two folks that are very very close to uh if not 500 points in barracks case <laughs> above me so um without further ado uh we'll hop into the games let me just show the deck list off and honestly there's not a ton different um i literally changed one card and there might be an argument to to change uh it as well so i cut one of the guardian defenders which i still think is an excellent uh tempo play and i added nope didn't add that added wild host um and just my thinking here is like these games are going into you know you're trying to close things out within 10 to 12 turns if not sooner obviously but against orcs against some of the tougher matchups that's how long they're going and so it just feels like we're in a meta where even though i'm the aggressor even though i don't want to spend turn three or potentially three energy just drawing cards i think you need it um and i also don't have the defense card very noteworthy here that does the spirit stones um for one energy and i actually don't think you want it right now in the meta i, I think it's better to have the draw an extra card and sometimes you also hit uh a, an extra copy of a legendary i actually think that's why material is probably ahead of uh mr uriel unfortunately who i've abandoned because you have enough cards to work with so if you haven't tried this i i was talking about this in the eldar channel i would add at least a, a wild toast to the deck i could also see an argument where you cut a guardian defender or potentially something else although i don't know that i would switch any of the other numbers um to basically go a little bit more mid-range right um but i do the the one guardian defender and some of these these curve apps just feel so good um, so if you haven't seen this list, this comes from Shrigra Mail way back in the day. This is this is uh, their build, um, and it's just it's just great. It's just very solid, and and I don't think there's a lot to tinker with. Um, Veteran Guardian is is a nice way of kind of preserving that stone if someone is able to clear a three health target. Uh, Warlock can be super super swingy, and we'll actually see in one of the matchups why it was like incredibly crucial. Um, for that plus one health to all your troops. Um, you know, wind riders are just really good for the, you know, taking out those those little units and especially in matchups where you need to be clearing early and often, aka the Tau. Um, Banshee's Mask, really good for tempo, of course. Um, Shroud Runner, also very good, I think, into Tau matchup, being able to have that three uh, sniper to clear something. Striking Scorpion, um, I think I... I may have only one of or two of. I've been running it as a one of. I, I could also see maybe tinkering with that a little bit. Um, I do think that Striking Scorpion has just gotten better in a slower meta because the ability to be uh, stealth and punch in for four damage and then they have to clear it on the backside. This thing having three energy has made this card like way more viable. So I do think that that's worth uh, looking into. But I felt good about the balance. I felt good about the one warp spider. Sometimes this thing is an all-star in some of these slower matchups because they can't hit it. And then if they can't find a way to set it up so that it'll die, there are times where I actually just wanted to punch their face uh, you know, over and over again or be able to clear a unit that's not going to trade with it. And then when you need the... Uh, the spirit stone then you trade it and so one has also felt very good and then we're running our one of wild hosts which while we'll see featured in a game uh, i think was was really helpful so um i i do think that we're in a meta where um and depending on how the balance goes right we'll have like a week where uh basically you know all the advice that i'm giving you today is going to be relevant um i think that you want one of wild host i don't think you need to but dance of death this thing is so powerful um, and I only got it recently and uh, it just when you have these low tempo turns from some of these control decks and then you just get to clear their units for free and keep building up your board or just smacking them for four and even when uh, you know any of the orcs have armor right you're still punching for two right so it just Dance of Death makes a huge huge difference uh, in the format right now Eldritch Storm also 
If they can't stop you, you know, from accumulating spirit stones, this becomes like a huge burn spell in the late game. And uh, in some of my games, I literally just hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it, and then pull the trigger at the last moment. Um, and it really turns uh, the game into, into a win. And it's also particularly good against experimental drones, which provide shields to all drones um, because it hits, knocks off all the, uh, the shields, and then hits again. So I think Elder Storm is also in an excellent place. Howling Banshee, just one of the best four drops that you can ever play. And this thing just feels so, so good, especially into combat-based leaders with the, the stun. It's just such an excellent card. Nadu also just able to set up some really obnoxious board states. Um, and it is a pretty strong card overall. Spirit Seer, probably one of the best tempo plays um, to pretty much turn the game into your favor. Striking Scorpion Hexarch. Basically what this card reads is deal 8 damage to your opponent and get a Spirit Stone later. Um, that's that's how you're going to play this card. Uh, I don't. You're hardly ever going to need want this to clear a unit. You just want to punch them in the face for 8 because you've also got Wailing Doom at the, at the top of your curve for 8 damage as well. And you just really have to treat them as a burn spell. The Wraith Blades, although, although nerfed, still very necessary, still very useful. Uh, Crimson Hunter, absolute all-star, can take out, um, you know, uh, any of these uh, battle suits that are flying, um, as well as being able to clear Storm Boy, um, the veteran Storm Boy. So Crimson Hunter just feels in a very, very good spot in the meta right now. And Hemlock Wraith Fighter, it got nerfed. It's definitely less powerful, but still, you know, gets the job done. And I do think it's a little bit more in line with, you know, the fact that Wailing Doom is kind of your legendary card and does more for you in some scenarios. But uh, so Hemlock Wraith Fighter got t toned down a little bit, and it's still just an excellent card. So that's enough of me talking. Let's get into two really solid matchups, and I booked Mark those uh, for us to get into. Um, so let me just excuse my scrolling real quick. Uh, so let's let's actually just start with the uh, the matchup against Grafair, <laughs> who does who does a little bit of trolling in this video, which which honestly it's been a while. So the Mulligan here, I actually think I maybe should have thrown back the Banshee's Mask. So we're gonna be able to make two drops for days, right? Um, Wraith Fighter, it's a little too early for, and Veteran Guardian. Really, what I'm looking for are stealth units. You know, potentially Banshee. Um, you know, just anything that's going to press as much damage early. Um, and, you know, although Veteran Guardian would be fine on maybe turn two or four. I'm almost never going to play it on turn two, though, because I just want to get the advantage. Um, we ship those back, and we get back, you know, some decent cards here. Um, and just everything you're doing here is pedal to the metal, right? And especially against the fact that Orcs have so much removal, you really, really want to spam your... Uh, Warlord ability. You want to be getting value out of the fact that A, they can't really clear your Spirit Stones very well, especially early, and B, that you're able to play a free 2-drop and just hold your resources in your hand, right? Because in a control meta, you do also have to make sure that you've got enough resources to keep up, right? So I'm pretty much going to be using my Warlord every single turn to clear the Grot and then just developing as much as I can. So we're on 3 energy, very easy here. We're going to play out the Striking Scorpion. Again, I wouldn't fault you for playing two of the card. Um, I just really couldn't find an area where I wanted to trim. It's possible that you can go down to one Banshee Mask if I'm really thinking about it. Um, but that can also be very good to protect your boards at times. So it's pretty tough. And again, we're going to get to see the power here, right? The fact that this has three health. Punch in for four damage. They're going to have to clear it on the backside. We get to continue developing. And so here we have a choice where we could like Banshee's Mask or we could use our passive, but just to be as energy efficient as possible, we just play the one drop and then we, we get our vehicles going here. And we actually get a solid one with Warwalker. Um, you know, not a card we would slot in our deck, right? But especially against things like Scorch Assault here, right? Where it's, it's going to be harder for us to go wide. Um, just getting discounted vehicles and even the Wind Rider to clear something in a pinch. Um, you know, just feels really good where, you know, they're not developing their board, they're taking out our little units. And then we just, this curve is so good, right? And then being able to or play our, um, I always forget this guy's name, the Spirit Seer, uh, right? When they have nothing on board is just going to be a bit of a pain for them. Um, they get the Grizzled Scarboy, which is great time for them to do it. 
And it's at this point that I would just encourage you not to tilt, right? Like this, it's going to be hard, right? Um, you know, being able to play exactly on turn five, uh, the Grizzled Scarboy, the fact that they got to gain four health, right? It's going to be a hard matchup. Every damage counts, though. And if you play very tightly around Will of Gork and just pressing your advantage, it's winnable. And so, you know, I would just encourage you when it's easy to feel like, oh, God, you know, how am I going to get through this? Um, just just keep your keep your mental there. So we're on we're on five energy here. Right. So we still have, you know, at least another turn to develop before we're going to see Will of Gork. So that's kind of where my thinking is at. Right. So perfect time. Let's get the Warwalker down for four. Let's use our ability again. Right. Keep our resources in our hand if we if we can. And then we're just going to punch with the Spirit Seer and ourselves, right? And even though it's a bad trade, it's fine because, and I'm not going to use my my Vanguard unit because I'm just going to make them have to punch it so that uh, we can, so they have to use their attack here. So if I attack there, sure, I'd get two damage, right? Because I get the plus three, but then they'd be able to clear another unit. So you just really want to think about tempo and you want to think about the fact that like you're trying to close the game out as soon as possible. So... Obviously, really clear attack from the walker there. Um, and you might be thinking, well, Tim, he's going to stun all your units after attacking, right? But look look at where the energy is, right? So I'm just going to cash in on every single point of damage here, assuming that Will of Gork is coming my way, right? And what do we have to also make it even harder? Banshee Mask, right? We get to hit them for two, stun them, so that if they don't have Will of Gork here, right? And maybe just a flanker. We're going to get to, you know, stop them from clearing our units, right? So you can kind of see how the tempo adds up. But they do have Crump to Gits, and I, I think it's, uh, yeah, it's the Squig buggy, and then they get, get to attack with the Squig, which at first I was like, why would you do that? But this allows them to clear everything and our Spirit Stone. So Graph Air playing this out, this, this sequence out perfectly. And uh, it's at this point that all of our hard work feels like it didn't pay off in a, in a sense but we are up on life and that's pretty good we've got tons of cards in hand we actually have more than the orc player so uh we've got a really clear sniper turn here also we're going to get some of that incidental damage from the unstable which definitely makes a difference when you have an aggressive deck and i think that's where you can get a little bit of a punish going and then here we're we're just gonna i would say just to pause here for a second so I, so I hit, you know, that's that's very clear. There's an argument to be made that I should be running out one of these Wind Riders, right? Because this is a very low pressure turn from us. And so I don't know that I played this turn well. I think this is a turn where I looked back at it and I'm like, I probably should have just chucked out the two energy Wind Rider because even if it does get Will of Gorked, it's really not that bad. You know, this card's not going to do that much anyway. Um, and if I don't kind of force them to play Will of Gork, I'm going to lose the game, right? Because uh, they're going to stabilize enough where it doesn't matter. So I think this is a turn where you might want to just uh, kind of put your Wind Rider out as like another way to, to maybe bait out some flankers or removal because this is a very low pressure turn. So, uh, all right. So they Prophet of Wall. So we, we know that the odds are pretty high that they're going to have Will of Gork. Um, it's it's possible they could have missed, right? They could have hit something else. So I think that here I get a little bit greedy with the uh, the board presence, but I think part of my logic here, right, is that if they don't have the Will of Gork, they're going to be dead, um, right? So we're we're just going to play out the rest of our turn, um, you know, kind of as succinctly as we can. And it's not all that greedy to be playing Warlock out here, right? Like, if they will of Gork here, it sucks. But it's not the end of the world. Um, yes, we're going to lose two units for, for their one card. But also, if they if they want to try and fight us for board position, then we can still get a good bit of damage in. So, smartly, I'm sure Grafair opts to not play will of Gork, right? And so, I just have to punch in as much damage as possible, obviously, before the Bomb Squig is going to go off. But then I sort of stop myself and go, you know what? Actually, we have a really good Nadu turn here and can get quite a bit of value um, just being able to clear, clear, 
Nadu hopefully doesn't die, and he doesn't. And then we can send the rest of the damage, and the rest of our board lives. Right, so here I think I should have pumped the brakes a little bit. So I go Path of Command, and then I think I play the Warlock again. Um, I don't think that that's... It, it's tough, right? Because, like, they're going to Will of Gork, but I'm, I'm getting to pump in an extra bit of damage here. And I'm also going to collect a huge amount of Spirit Stones. So I do, I do think that when you get to this point in the game, you just say, if you have it, you have it. And if you don't, you're dead. But even if you do have it, right, I'm going to collect all these Spirit Stones, and I've got a Hemlock Wraith Fighter in my hand. All right, so again, I'm not going to say that I, I played two of these turns perfectly. I, I do think I should have thought a little bit more about just kind of like the stage of the game we're at and how much pressure we're applying. But getting down, you know, Mr. Uh, Mr. Gaskell over there to the sub-8 health range is exactly where we want them, right? So no need to play our uh, Hunter out, right? Let's just take advantage of our Sheep Shuriken unit, and then we're going to use our Path of Command again to just get us some value. And then we're just going to play out our Exarch and hope that they don't have a way to um, mucking about it, right? We've got two additional units. Hopefully that's enough. But with the combination of flankers as well, it's it's going to be tough. But this is optimal, right? We've, you know, our, the way that we've paced this game out and the, the tempo that we've gained means that we're up five health. And, you know, really, if we draw any combination of direct damage, we're going to be able to close things out. So they... They do end up having the monkey about here, unfortunately. But we're going to pick up the Spirit Stones and kind of just keep on moving. So we could play Crimson Hunter here, right, to take out the Storm Boy. But there's no reason not to get the value off the Wraith Fighter, right? So it's a little less efficient in terms of uh, the fact that Crimson Hunter would just kill that outright. But we get the extra two damage on the Warlord here. And then we're going to play out both of our two drops, because why not? Um, if they have another Will of Gork, so be it. Right, um, and we're just gonna try and close this out. So again, you know, it's it's ideal that we were able to not see a will of Gork. I think until nine energy, um, and they even have actually a really really good turn here. Um, you know, like Grafair plays this really really well, gets a bunch of health, is able to clear I think everything. Um, you know, and that's the power of the orcs, right? It's like, even when they're behind, they have so many ways of, of getting back into the game, so many ways of healing. So, um, you know, even here, I'm just like, all right, I mean, do I have enough damage? We'll see. You know, at least I've got the second hemlock if I need it, and that, that probably should be enough. Um, but we don't even have to think too hard because we do get our whaling due and call it a day. So, um, yeah. So, you know, I think... You really just like every single turn, you have to fig you have to walk this tightrope of applying enough pressure to close out the game, but not bleeding enough card advantage that you get got by good flanking turns, good crump to gets turns, or will of gork just really ruining your day. So it's it's tightrope matchup, and I'm not going to say that you're going to win it, but I think if you play it really really tightly. I think you're, you, you will up your win percentage in the long run against them because uh, you can really, really punish slow and clunky gas coal turns. Um, so that's why I think it's worth talking about. But here's, here's the matchup that I, I really want to kind of make this video to showcase because I think I've seen a ton of Anva on ladder and I really wanted to feature a video. You know, I've been talking about the Tau all week. Now I want to talk about how to kind of play against them. So shipping back the Guardian here, again, looking for something that's going to pressure more. But happy to keep the Wind Rider, happy to keep the Howling Banshee. The flank units are going to allow us to just keep clearing if they're going for drones, or hopefully be able to clear a trade for some of their, their battle suits. But the Veteran Guardian's not terribly important here. So um, we do we do want to ship that back, and we get a Strike the Scorpion. Feels, feels good. Barrick, I played against... You know, quite a bit. Obviously, a really strong player. Almost always in the top 10, top 20. Um, so, we know this is going to be a good one. And uh, But we've got the advantage of the fact that they've got a clearer unit, you know, in the early turns. And they're not going to be able to clear the Spirit Stone, for the most part. So, um, we're going to start accruing our advantage. 
we start the game drawing a Wailing Doom. So that also, it's kind of like when you're playing Space Marines and you've got your Death From Above's in your hand, right? Or your, your Heroism card. It just, you have so much more incentive to just play your turns out as aggressively as possible. Now here I could have gone Striking Scorpion, but in my mind, if this game goes late, I want extra cards. Let me just use my Warlord ability to pressure rather than chucking out the Striking Scorpion, right? Because I know next turn I'm probably just going to Howling Banshee anyway. So we're, we're really always thinking about our sequencing, the amount of energy we have, and how to get the most bang for our buck out of every single unit because that's what it's like <laughs> when you play against uh, just very, very strong control decks is you just have to squeeze out every ounce of damage, right? And so here I could have actually just played my Wind Rider to clear that by itself. And then punch Anva in the face. I think that might have been better. But because they didn't really pressure that much, we actually just, again, get to use our War Warlord ability all three turns and, and apply some pressure. And this still suit, just to pause for a second, I think th this four drop is, is really excellent. I, I imagine we're going to see this probably in every single Tau build. Um, so if you have not played with or against this card, it's, it's a really, really solid card. And you kind of want to have a game plan. So we can't kill it, right? So we know that a, uh, a flanking unit is going to come in and be able to clear our um, Wind Rider very easily. So you'll see me, like, I think it take a little bit of time here. But uh, towards the end of the turn, after I've figured out what I want to play, I go, I'm going to hit Anva for three damage. Because this unit's going to die one way or another. And I'm not going to leave it on the board um, you know, to make it so that the Warlord attacks it, I just want to use it as like three damage to the face. So um, definitely don't get comfortable in those kind of old play patterns where you're like, oh, I can make them use a unit to attack it or my Warlord. Like, you have to be applying pressure against the Tau and the Orcs. So just kind of make sure that you've, you're getting that sort of concept <laughs> through, through your head and in your bones because uh, it's going to win you games. Um, so here, this is exactly where Crimson Hunter shines, just being able to take out that uh, battle suit um, completely, right? And uh, there's no there's no efficient way for us to clear this unit, so we just gotta kind of they get their two for one here, right? But we still get another Spirit Stone. We're up to five, right, on turn six. Um, so it just means for the rest of the game, you know, we're we're gonna be playing with that advantage. So another Still Suit is good, but this just means that we're going to get to punch with our Crimson Hunter. And this is the turn where the game just kind of turns in our favor, like pretty, pretty clearly, right? So Spirit Seer is a huge tempo play when you get it. And then we play Warlock, right? And I think this is really important. I was thinking about this. I was like, should I just play my Path of Command, right, and get, get my advantage, or should I play Warlock? The reason that you need to play Warlock from this kind of position, right, is that if they have the Fusillade, right, and Kion Tactics, some of these are going to live, right? So it's going to deal, uh, what is it? It'll deal four to everything, right? So so everything but the um, Warlock will live, and then you've got a little bit of health left over. So also the fact that we, we get to play two units and one unit for free. We've already got the Hunter, which we want to punch their face with, Um means that you should you should play warlock here so that's what i mean by this this plus one health actually just really comes in handy and it allows us to hit for eight damage right plus one damage um and and all of it all of it all of it counts so uh this is a really really nasty curve from us um we've even got two spirit stones left over it's about to be turn eight we've got wailing tune in our hand you know, um, I would say this game went pretty ideally, but like these are the sorts of board states that you're hoping to create. So they do end up having Barrick Scott, the Kion Tactics Plus Fusillade. And they're able to do, you know, make pretty short work of our board also because they've got the Tidewall Gun Rig, which I was curious which one they were holding. And uh, I do think probably Tidewall Gun Rig um, allowed them to have even a shot at this game. But again, they've had to use so many resources. We're up seven health. We've got the Wailing Doom in our hand. So really now it's just about, okay, let's close the gap, get them in range of Wailing Doom, and stay alive ourselves. So 
We get to stun. We get to clear their unit. We get to attack for two, knocking them down to 11. Make another unit, right? And we're not going to Banshee's Mask here, although we could, because I'd rather save the stun, you know, potentially for another turn. You know, you can make the argument that you're like, well, Tim, you, you want to burn them down. Uh, but here, it actually doesn't end up mattering. But um, but I think you, you really want to use your... You want to stagger your stun abilities, even if you could get a little bit more damage, um, because you really do get quite a bit of tempo. Um, so all you have to figure out here is how do I get enough damage, right? So uh, we punch here, we punch here, we Wailing Doom to get the blast, because we have, we have more than enough Spirit Stones, and that's going to be GG. So... Again, you know, I will say we had a pretty ideal curve, so I, I don't want to say that, like, you're always going to kind of run a, away with the game in this sort of fashion, but this is how you punish certain Tau builds, right? Is that you're just getting so much advantage from your Spirit Stones, and you've got such cheap and sort of efficient threats, and then you have a really good, like, you're, once you get to 8 energy, right, if they're not, if they're not really protecting their life total well, you know, they could die to Hemlock or they could die to Wailing Doom. So, you know, it just goes to show that, like, again, I just, I, I don't want to, I do think that there are going to be nerfs for Tau at some point. I Again, I don't think we should expect them for literally the balance patch two weeks after they're released, right? Um, we're, we're, we're not even at two weeks. We'll be at two weeks uh, in a couple of days. So um, I wouldn't expect that, but what I, I do hope to see are just buffs to other factions and definitely not the orcs, right? Um, I do think that the ultramarine, like let's, let's start from the bottom just to close out the video. Necrons are in my opinion, the worst shape. Now, do they have still, I, I still think Imitech can have a good win rate. I still think Oricon actually with, uh, with Scarabs is like not in a bad spot um, necessarily. But I do think the overall power of that faction has been completely overshadowed. So, like, I, I do hope that we see some Necron buffs. I do hope that we see some Ultramarine buffs. Um, I don't I don't really want to see buffs necessarily for Eldar, although I don't think it would be terrible if you if you switched a number here or there. Um, because they, they just, again, feel so balanced. Yes, they've got two matchups that are, that are pretty rough. Um, and even against Uriel, it's it's not always the easiest. Um, but they they just feel like such a balanced faction to me. So I, I don't know that you'd want to touch them. And then you've you really got Chaos doing generally fine. And, you know, I, I don't think really needing adjusting. And then you've got Orcs and Tau. Now, I wouldn't be I wouldn't be upset to see some adjusting of the Orcs. I do think that the fact that they're the only uh, you know, faction with Think something like Will of Gork makes it so we're all kind of playing around that, right? And like, if you're playing control, you might as well just play orcs, right? So there, there's not as much dynamic kind of meta decisions being made because the orcs have like this insane toolkit and the best, you know, board wipe in the game, best kind of control material. And then you've got Tau, who I, I still don't think they're going to have the same sort of win rate that orcs at the highest level do because I just still think that orcs kind of are, they're like the Eldar, but like on steroids in a way, like they can kind of address everything, but do it better like two times. <laughs> and they, they just have like a lot of flexibility, even with Crump to gets, you know, kind of entering the meta. It, it feels like there's, they're so multidimensional. And I don't think the Tau are as multidimensional. I think, some of the more broken strategies or best curve outs are built around drones and companions. And I think battle suits are good, but I I, I think that, you know, tempo oriented de oriented decks, especially like uh, you know, the Meta Gale deck here, I think does really well into them. So um we'll see. I mean I, I've seen some I've seen some Tau nerfs posted in feedback, you know, people speculating, whatever. Again, I wouldn't get your hopes up about that. I don't think a faction that was released so soon is going to be nerfed so soon, but maybe I'll be surprised. And we should hear that announcement maybe on Monday or Tuesday. I'm recording as of Sunday, so um, we'll see. I'm I'm interested to see. So I hope this was a, a little refreshing from all, all the Tau content we've been putting on the channel. Um, and I hope, if anything, it's given some Eldar players a bit of hope 
And uh, honestly, just anyone who's not loving Tau, um, I, I would encourage you to think about playing this deck. Um, you know, I think there are some numbers you can maybe tweak here. I do think the more I've thought about this, like maybe it makes sense to have two of the three drop Scorpion instead of two um, Banshee's Mask. Because I don't think Banshee's Mask is terribly relevant in, in some of the more important matchups right now. Um, but uh, play around with it. See what you think. Let me know in the comments. Um, and finally, for the people on this channel who are waiting for Eldar content, we've got something here. So uh, thanks so much. And as always, I will catch you guys next time.